Good morning and Merry Christmas. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Christmas morning. We're so glad you're here. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's share with each other a sign of God's presence and God's peace. Please be seated while we share with you some announcements. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Feels like we were just here, huh? <laughs> Can we go home? Look at all the hymns we're going to sing again tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's the same. We'll just keep singing, right? We're just really glad you're here. Good morning. Good morning. Um, please fill out a worship card and place it in the offering plate. And um, wear a mask if you feel like you're like you need to or you want to. Um, hopefully, COVID is on the downhill slide once again. Um, today, following worship, take a look at this beautiful nativity scene from Pastor and Mary, <laughs> and uh, also the crimson ornaments on the tree. You know, they were made, I don't know, some of you may not know, they've been made for, I don't know how many, over 50 years, I believe. Well over 50 years, right? Well, yeah. Yep. And they're just such part of our, our, our treasure chest at our church. Um, stay for treats and coffee after in, in the fellowship hall. Um, last week, our noisy offering brought in $60.98. And that's used for the LSS emergency fund. And they're so grateful for that noisy offering. Thank you. Um, on Wednesday, we'll be taking a break for our adult ed, but we'll be resume on um, January 4th at 10. It's on um, the study, it's called What is the Bible by Rob Bell? And we just absolutely are loving the study. In fact, so much so that we'll be doing this as adult ed at nine o'clock after we finish our um, book that we're studying on uh, Matthew. Um, so please um, join us if you can. It's always, um, you can jump in any old time. It's a great, great discussion. Um, joys and concerns. Curtis passed away on Thursday. Keep Diane in your prayers. It's tough times, Diane. We're really sorry for your loss. Uh, Nancy Kay uh, passed away on December 14th, and Dave, Dave and Tiana were with her. Services are going to be held here on Thursday, January the 5th at 2 o'clock, um, and the congregation is all, we're all invited to um, participate. That family has been members since October 31st of 1993, so join us if you can for that celebration of life. Um, thank you again for all the donations. Um, food, money, gift cards, and they were all uh, distributed at a really great party. I just got pictures today from Wendy Rubio, and they just had the best party. Oh, they're great pictures. We'll share them in the newsletter. Also, uh, Faye Esperanza had their event, the Las Posadas, and some cute pictures from that as well. So watch those for the newsletter. And then clothing for the Samaritan House for Men, Lydia House for Women, and young children were distributed by Sandy and uh, uh, Debbie and Eve even last week. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for all your donations. We bought lots of goats and chickens and pigs and honeybees. We had a really lovely turnout for uh, all of that as well. So um, you can also take one of the ornaments if you want off the tree, and it's never too late to send a goat. Oh, the tree's down. Okay, well, it's gone. Um, but you can still buy a goat any old time. The congregational meeting and lunch will be on January 22nd following worship. Um, if you do need to do a report, please get them into Sandy no later than January 5th so that we can put that together and be well prepared 
for our congregational meeting. We'll also be presenting our spending plan. So please put that on your calendar and plan to join us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Please stand as you're able and let's prepare our hearts for worship with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Word made flesh, our life and our salvation. Amen. Trusting the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior, let us confess our sin. God of life, you promise good news of great joy for all people and call us to be messengers of your peace. We confess that too often we hoard our joy, our resources, and our security. We nurture conflict and build barriers. We neglect the needs of our neighbors and ignore the growing of creation. Have mercy on us. Where we are self-centered, open our hearts. Where we are reluctant, give us courage. Where we are cynical, restore our trust. Renew us with your grace and give us again the hope of eternal life in you. Amen. Hear the good news. We are children of God and heirs of God's promises through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus, we are forgiven and redeemed. Sing with joy for all the ends of the earth shall know the salvation of God. Amen.
our prayer of the day. Almighty God, you gave us your only Son to take on our human nature and to illumine the world with your light. By your grace, adopt us as your children and enlighten us with your spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm the lecturer this morning. <laughs> Our first reading is from Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your sentinels lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy, for in plain sight, they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together in the singing, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has, has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Word of wisdom, word of life. Thanks be to God. Second reading is from Hebrews, the first chapter, beginning at the first verse. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Word of wisdom, word of life. Thanks has not overcome it. That can also be translated as the darkness has not understood it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. 
But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of the blood, not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in my sight, O Lord, my redeemer and my God. Well, last night you got the warm and fuzzy Christmas sermon because we had the warm and fuzzy Christmas gospel from Luke. Now today you're going to get the esoteric Christmas sermon because we've got this esoteric text from the Gospel of John. I, ha I have a confession. I deeply and truly love Christmas, but the sheer enormity of it sometimes leaves me flummoxed. I'm not talking about all the shopping and all the bustle and preparation at home and in church. I'm not even grumbling about the over-the-top commercialism or all the different greeting card interpretations of the true meaning, which can put you in a kind of psychological sugar coma if you try to swallow it all at once. I'm talking about the daunting task of trying to convey a genuine and meaningful understanding of the incarnation. The idea that this mystery we call God, the maker of everything, came to us as one of us. The idea that God became flesh and lived among us, from gestation to birth to death, as a particular person in a particular place and in a particular time, so that we could begin to more fully understand that God is with us in all persons in all creatures, in all creation, and at all times. That thought, that idea, that reality we call the incarnation is so enormous and mind-boggling that it's really tempting to retreat into the less cosmic halo of ideas that hover around the manger in Bethlehem. Ideas like innocence, and love personified, and new beginnings. These are all good, true, and valuable things. They're meaningful parts of the package. But the goodness, the truth, the new beginnings, and love that we see in that holy child become even more potent when we begin to truly understand what God is doing in that manger in Bethlehem. When the early followers of Jesus began to write down their understanding of who Jesus was and what he was about, when they began to explain what they meant when they called him the Christ, Christos, the Anointed One, it's clear that they saw him as something more than just a great spiritual teacher or religious leader. You don't have to read very far in these early writings to discover that these followers of Jesus thought that there was something of cosmic importance about him. Early on, they called him the Son of God, but that description didn't seem to be enough for some of them. It didn't seem to fully capture the cosmic fullness of what they had experienced in Jesus, the Christ. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word, said the writer of Hebrews. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, wrote St. Paul. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, all things, whether on earth or in heaven. 
Late in the first century, a writer we've come to know as John sat down to write his account of Jesus. He wasn't interested in creating just another chronicle of the life of Jesus, as others had done. He wanted to explore the meaning of Jesus. He wanted to make it clear that Jesus the Christ was not someone who could be defined, contained, or constrained by geography or time or even philosophy. Because the God of all geography and time and philosophy was and is somehow present in him. John began his gospel like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and that life was the light of all humanity. The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we gazed on his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The language of this prologue is pure poetry, but it's also philosophy. And in a strange, far-sighted way, John was brushing up against physics. The Greek word we translate as word is logos. Logos was a word that ancient philosophers loved to play with. And because of that, we have numerous ways to translate it. One of the oldest meanings of logos was story or narrative. Where does your mind go if you hear in the beginning was the story, and the story became flesh and lived among us. Logos could also mean content or reason or statement. Other philosophical meanings included order, idea, blueprint, primordial template, primal thought, or intention. Logos became flesh and lived among us. The metaphysical became physical. If that sounds too esoteric, consider quantum physics. Energy moves through quantum fields as abstract math mathematical wave functions. When wave functions are observed, they tend to collapse into particles. Particles continually move through patterns in a kind of quantum dance always moving toward closeness, joining, partnering, combining. Fermions dance with bosons, neutrinos, muons, gluons, leptons, and quarks assemble themselves into protons, neutrons, and electrons, which assemble themselves into atoms, which assemble themselves into molecules we call elements. Hydrogen and carbon molecules dance together to form the four essential organic compounds nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. And out of all of this comes life. The word, the story, the pattern, the intention, the thought, the dance becomes flesh and dwells among us. The great British physicist, astrophysicist, James Jeans wrote, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. Mind no longer appears as an accidental intruder into the field of matter. We're beginning to suspect that we ought rather to hail it as a creator and governor of the realm of matter. We discover that the universe shows evidence of a designing or controlling power that has something in common with our own mind. This is the incarnation, the great thought of God, expressed in the whole universe, condensed itself into a singular human life and lived among us. And why would God do that? Love. 
Teilhard de Chardin saw love as the driving force of the universe. For Teilhard, love is a passionate force at the heart of the Big Bang universe. The fire that breathes life into matter and unifies elements center to center. Love is deeply embedded in the cosmos, a cosmological force. God is love, we read in 1 John. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love became flesh and lived among us, and still lives among us, and within us, and around us, and beyond us. Love, God, was not content to be an abstract idea or a mere sentiment. God, the author of life, the one in whom we live and move and have our being is love with a capital L, love personified. And love is all about relationships. Christmas is when God, the love that founded the universe, showed up as one of us in order to show us in person just how much we are loved and in order to teach us to love each other more freely and fully, more completely. Love became flesh and lived among us so that we might learn how to love God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves. Love didn't come to us as a king or potentate to lord it over us. Love came as a poor baby among a poor and oppressed people far from the centers of privilege and power in order to show us that the fire that breathes life into matter and unifies elements center to center is alive in and breathing life into all of us and wants to unify us with each other center to center and heart to heart. It's an enormous idea, this thing called Christmas, this incarnation. This idea that the word became flesh encompasses everything. Everything we see and everything we don't see. It speaks in poetry then carries us into the depths of philosophy and physics. It warms the heart and boggles the mind. It is quite literally everything. And the beating heart of it is love. To even begin to understand the incarnation, we have to open our minds and our hearts. As another early follower of Jesus wrote, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. In Jesus' name. Merry Christmas.
thanksgiving for Christ's coming into the world. We pray for the church, the life of the earth, and the whole human family. The church in every land makes a joyful noise to herald your coming, O oh God. We give thanks for poets, musicians, and hymn writers who give voice to, your, to our praise, and for all who lead the church's worship. God of grace, hear our prayer. This day dawns with new hope for all living things, and from ocean's depth to mountain peaks, the earth rejoices. Inspire in us an urgent zeal to protect the planet and renew its resources. God of grace, hear our prayer. Bring heavenly peace to this world and an end to armed conflict, especially in Ukraine. Raise up leaders in every nation who will honor human rights and establish equal justice for all people. Give courage to all who speak out against oppression and advocate for the powerless. God of grace, hear our prayer. Bless all who gather to worship on this holy day. Be present at our tables and celebrations and watch over those who travel. Sustain charities, outreach ministries, and food pantries that give generously to people in need. We pray especially for Fabia Spranza and their work in feeding the hungry. God of grace. Guard the lives of any in danger, especially those who work to protect others. Lead any who are in desperate circumstances to sanctuary, health, and safety. Grant rest to the weary and soothe those who are troubled. We pray especially for the family and the friends of Nancy Kaka Kurila mourning her passing, and for the family and the friends of Curtis and of Kyle mourning his passing. For Edie's sister Dorothy, for Gary Hoover suffering from dementia, and for his wife and family at this difficult time of the year. Bless all caregivers with patience and compassion. We pray for Frank Stanley recovering from hip replacement surgery, for David Witt, for Bill Plummer, Janet Sims, Diane Kyle, Renee Wright, Chuck Dean, Judy Mello, Debbie Nahibian, and those on the prayer wall. For whom else do we pray? God of grace, hear our prayer. In Christ we have beheld your glory, full of grace and truth, pondering the mystery of eternal love made flesh in Christ Jesus. We commend all for whom we pray to the mercy of God. Amen. Please be seated as we receive our tithes and our offerings.
Please rise. God of abundance, receive and bless these gifts we have offered. Join our hearts with the song of the angels and gather us at your table of celebration. Strengthen us to share with all the world the abundance of your grace upon grace, poured out in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. In the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory, that beholding the God made visible, we may be drawn to love the God whom we cannot see. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. This is my body broken for you. Do this often, and as you eat it, remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this often, and as you drink it, Remember me. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he returns. Therefore, we can pray with confidence to the Father in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on our earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We will receive communion by intinction. That means simply that you dip the bread into either the red wine or the white grape juice. Red wine is on one side of the chalice and white. White. White grape juice is on the other side of the chalice. And I think Jesus finds both acceptable. So <laughs> everyone is invited to receive this sacrament. These are God's gifts for all people. And we are here merely to serve the gifts of God for the people of God. Come to the table for all is prepared. <laughs>
Please stand as you're with me. We have now received the bread of life, the wine of grace. At this table, we encounter Christ in person so that we may bring Christ to every person we encounter in Jesus' name. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us. May the Lord be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and open our hearts and minds to the deep wonder of incarnation. And as we walk into a world that is all holy ground, may we know peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.